Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Awareness Podcast. Um, before we begin, I would like to just thank Jackie Greggs for the wonderful podcast episodes that she did for us. Um, Jackie has decided to step back from the podcast for the rest of the year. And so I'm here today to introduce our new host, Jenny Beale. Welcome, Jenny. It's a pleasure to welcome you on board. Hi, Susan. So some of you listening may already know Jenny as she's a popular co-host on Bill Free's book studies. And you may also have caught her interview with Bernardo Castrop for the Know Thyself conference last September. I really enjoyed that interview. Um, so just to, by way of introduction, I want to read you Jenny's bio and then we'll discuss um, what Jenny's spiritual path has been and what she is going to take as her theme for the rest of the year on the Awareness Podcast. So in her early 20s, Jenny became interested in the ideas of P.D. Uspensky and eventually found her way to Dr. Francis Rolls, who was a student of Uspensky. In addition to studying his system, she was also introduced to the Advaita teachings of the Shankarakarya Shantananda Saraswati, a progressive path to self-realization that involves the practice of mantra meditation. After following that teaching for over 40 years, and despite having had clear and lasting glimpses of her true nature, Jenny realised something was still missing. And that search led her to the direct path and to Rupert Spira. And it was through his teaching that she discovered the permanent and imperturbable peace and ease of being that is the birthright of us all. After that, her desire to deepen her understanding, together with her love of science and mathematics, which we share, Jenny, led her to Francis Lucille, where she discovered the freedom and joy in living and not knowing. Jenny currently leads groups exploring the non-dual teaching, and she loves to share her understanding with truth seekers and truth lovers everywhere. So again, Jenny, welcome to the Awareness Podcast. I'm looking forward to this conversation to dig into the various paths that you have been on and also to hear the direction um, because it's summed up. Your theme is going to be the joy of living in not knowing. And um, that's the realisation that you have come to through Francis's teachings so I'm interested to present that to our audience and for them to hear what they might learn about that going forward this year. So um, I always like to start my interviews with people by asking them, were there any clues in your childhood about spirituality? Often some of us have had some kind of mystical experience or some kind of clue that came in childhood. Did that appear for you at all? Well, you know, um, in my childhood, I was never interested in, in God or religion or anything like that. But what I, what I was interested in was how the world worked with in the, the ultimate uh, uh, of everything. And in my teens, I became fascinated with infinity. Mm -hmm. And um, there's uh, this uh, uh, beautiful uh, proof, which I'm sure you, you actually know of the uncountability of real numbers, which really shows um, that there are different sizes of infinity. And it is just, it was just utterly mind blowing. It's, uh, there's a whole science or a whole mathematics of infinity just developed by Cantor, a great mathematician. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. But also on the science um, side, I was very 
keen on science. I love the natural world um, and um, just being out in nature, but my my real scientific interest at, at that stage was in um, physics and in the very large and the very small. So cosmology, what's what what's the ultimate? What 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 is the universe really? Is it infinite and unbounded or is it infinite and bounded which is also a possibility um, you know what, what 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 is it how did it come into being um uh, and then also the uh, the very small being fascinated by quantum theory which um in those days was a bit more in its infancy almost yeah but you, you decided not to study physics. You, you, you have a degree in mathematics. I, I have a degree in mathematics. It was the it was the fascination with infinity, but also it was about certainty. Um, yes. in, in, in physics, um, uh, well, the way it's really the, the same for the whole of science, um, you, you develop a, a model which explains your your experience and is able to is very helpful because it's able to predict experience and it enables you to uh, to to build things uh, to make life comfortable uh, for for yourself. So, uh, but then that model um, is always found to to be limited and not quite right in certain areas. So you then get another model. So you get one model after another model after another model. And I felt intuitively, and I still feel uh, intuitively, that there is no end to science. We will never find uh, a perfect model which models um, our experience. Mathematics, on the other hand, is is very different. I wanted certainty, and mathematics gives you certainty because um, something is either a valid proof or it's not a valid proof. Um, but then um, when I went on to study mathematics, I was very keen on the foundations uh, of maths, and then I discovered Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which um, basically say that even the logic we use is not complete. And so here, yeah, mathematics is becoming more like physics in a, in a way, incomplete. And it, it was that search for, for the ultimate, but also a search for, uh, for certainty as, uh, uh, as well, which um, I, I guess ultimately um, led me to what uh, you might call a, a, a spiritual search. Yeah. So how did that come about? In your bio, you said in your early 20s, your first uh, teacher was Uspensky. I'm not actually familiar with Uspensky. So um, if you could tell us a little bit about, and also Dr. Francis Rolls, um, if you could tell us a little bit about how that how that interest came about and what you learned from from them it, it came about by by chance um uh, actually it was um that always uh, well, we, 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 <laughs> <laughs> my, my first husband and i we were we were buying our first house and um we um needed someone to to witness uh, a signature on a document and we didn't know anyone where it, where the house was but there was just one person from his um, school that he remembers and he managed to get in contact with um, uh, as a witness and um, this person told me about um, Uspensky and um, a, a little experiment that Uspensky did trying to keep the mind free of thoughts for two minutes um, and then um, he told me about the School of Economic Science also called the School of Practical Philosophy um, which studied that, but it's a, it's a bit more of a it's a bit more of a cult, really. Mm. I stayed with that, and it's um, it's not women friendly in a way. It it regards yeah. women as being um, uh, incapable of self realization. Um, oh. So uh, only men are capable of self realization. Um, but at some point. Uh, after two years in that school, you're taught mantra meditation, but they were not allowed to teach it because they were, a, you know, a bit of a, a, a cult and not 
uh, it came from the Shankaracharya Shantanan Saraswati, and he he wasn't uh, allowing them to teach it directly. So um, they used to send us to the study society, which was why the where the head of that school had originally learnt uh, uh, about it, uh, uh, about the Shankaracharya and also about Ispensky. Um So um, immediately, um, it was Francis Rolls who. Um, initiated me into mantra meditation, and I immediately recognized. So women were allowed to know the mantra. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So what reason then? If women were not able to self-realize in their view, why bother teaching you mantra meditation? What were you going to get from that, from their perspective? From a, um, from their perspective, but also um, e- equally from the Shankaracharya's uh, perspective, what you learn from mantra meditation is it, you purify the mind. The whole idea was purification of the mind. And that was very attractive um, to, to me at that time, that idea, because I, um, I, I wanted control o- over my mind. I thought if I have complete control over my mind and I felt it was possible, um, completely wrong, actually. Um, but but I, it's what I felt at that time. <laughs> but, but I felt I would then be happy. <laughs> so, um, so so that's the same impulse that's what I wanted. The mathematical certainty, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, so it wasn't just mantra meditation we 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 learned there there were um it, it was a kind of merging of the svenskis teaching and the shankaracharya's teaching but all of it was a uh, was a process of purification and um sort of getting you to a higher level they talked about the ladder of self realization which had these seven levels so you you had to somehow progress up that and you're given all sorts of practices and exercises to do but there was also also another tradition that came in, which was the um, Mevlavi turning. It was also known as the whirling dervishes. It comes oh, yes. from the Sufi tradition. Yes, that, um, so, Rupert did that, didn't he? Yes, yes. So Rupert and I were, uh, it was the same society that we were, we were both at. Um, so yes, I did that too. Yeah. So is that the actual physical doing the doing very, the tra- very hard it very very tough training yeah, it, incredibly tough I and mean, you you're, you're holding your arms right up you know above your shoulders um for quite a long time yeah. and it, what did it, you get it, from that Jenny um it's it's a beautiful practice um, I mean, I couldn't do it physically now, um, uh, but it, it, it's beautiful because it um, it does lead the mind to a, a sort of peaceful, a peaceful state. Um, there's uh, initially there's a tension on um, the physical aspects uh, of the turning, but after a while, the the turning kind of does it does itself. And it, I would say in contrast to mantra meditation, the path is more through love. It, 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 it feels like a, a, a process of coming to a loving silence rather than just a silence. Mm. Um, it's back to practice. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you described, um, those paths as progressive paths we hear all the time you know about progressive paths and direct paths so just just in the simplest terms what's the difference between a progressive path and a direct path well a progressive path um, the idea of it is that it um, takes you to a state of the body and mind in which you are able um, to understand the true nature of yourself and reality. Um, so the idea that there are many different progressive paths, most of them involve some form of meditation and some for, some form of practice. Some uh, some are more uh, physically oriented, but um, a, a lot of them are just mentally oriented. Um, some of them um, they involve 
uh, sadhanas like um, following uh, a special diet, not not eating certain things or not eating very much. And there's there's a whole variety of ways which, in theory, are supposed to um, improve, um, purify your body uh, and your mind, so that you're ready. Um, to to understand the the ultimate teaching and the direct path and then the direct path that goes there straight away the the idea of the direct path it was um the term direct path was coined by Atmananda Krishnamenon um so he's back in the 20th century and it, he recognized that um all of the progressive paths, they, they lead to a, a point uh, at which you are taught directly um, what, what you really are, what the universe really is. And But he realized that actually that's all of this, um, all of this purification stuff is not, not always necessary. It's not it might not be necessary for everyone or maybe only a little bit of it's necessary it's not necessary to sort of um, put people through uh, a very well defined clear same for everyone path um, to realize their true nature so you you take people there as directly as you can for them for 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 that in individual depending on the past conditioning and uh, yeah. and so on yes okay so um you say in your bio that despite following the teaching for over 40 years and having had some clear and la lasting glimpses of your true nature there was still something missing so first of all are you able to articulate for us what what one of those glimpses was like? Are you able to to describe that? Or say what that was? Yes, yes. I mean, this was. I mean, the 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 strongest one, which we, which really did uh, did take me to a. Um, I can't say a full understanding because I didn't actually understand, but it took me exactly where I wanted to be. And that um, that, that happened um, in a very strange way. I was practicing like crazy. I was practicing everything that we were given to practice and all sorts of different things. And one of the things, um, for, for example, which is which is relevant, is that um, my teacher gave me a special practice, which was just for me and not many others, which was um, playing on the piano a chord of B flat right up to the top, holding the pedal down, listening to it as it faded away. And then just listening, listening, listening. And so you're just left in listening. And the sound is actually still there. And you can find the sound then in ordinary everyday life. So I was using that one quite a bit. I was using, I was using every other practice that I, I knew. And I was trying to kind of almost practice all day, even though I was working. Um, I, I was still trying to practice things. Um, and um, I went to a piano recital in uh, in Malvern, a little way away from me. And um, the was a brilliant pianist. He was uh, he was playing Ravel's Gaspar de la Nuit. And it was the second movement of it, which is um, it's based entirely on B flat, on the chord of B flat. It's called le gibet, uh, which is the, the gibbet, and it's about a hanged, uh, a, a man hanging, and so it's a, it, it's it's about death, and that uh, that performance, it was a young pianist, but it, it, it was so I don't know, it, it had this effect uh, on me, and it, it threw me into this deep dark night of the soul which lasted about uh, uh, about a week uh, after a couple of days I went to my teacher of the study society and said look I don't know what to do um, I, I can't meditate I can't do anything he said absolutely stop every single practice that, that, that you're doing stop all of it and 
uh, and don't go back to it and, uh, uh, until we've had a, a chat. Um, so I did that. Um, so I, I was I was really feeling terrible. It was uh, it was the worst depression you could possibly ever imagine. Um, and then gradually that that lessened after, uh, after about a week it it it, it lessened and then. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I woke up in the morning and the whole world seemed to have completely transformed overnight and I was the world. And there was, there was just happiness, there was just love. Um, I sort of walking on air, lightness, lightness of, uh, of being. And that that lasted for was over three months. Uh, and the depression uh, completely never, gone. Completely gone. Mm. Completely gone. And I, but after a while, uh, I was I don't know maybe four months or so. Um, gradually, 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 it sort of faded. I had no understanding of what it was. I because it wasn't what I conce I'd conceptualized self-realization to be, because it was total freedom. And I never thought of self-realization as being what freedom. What did you conceptualized it to be? I thought it um, to be something where you are completely in control over everything. You knew everything. Um, you never made a mistake. Um, everything went right for you. You had some mysterious powers as well, <laughs> and you know it was it was it was not a bit like that at all. Um, I, I still made mistakes, but I never worried about them, um, and just put them right. Up. I, I, I made them. It it was um, it was it was beautiful. It, it was tremendous. So. Yeah, that that faded, um, and faded very, very, very gradually. It was really uh, at the time that in the study society it was after Francis Rolls had died, and there was continual, continual quarrelling with between people wanting to um, uh, sort of become the uh, the leader, and, um, and I, I was uh, trying uh, at that time to. Um, to sort of, you know, be neutral and bring people together, but uh, at that at that point it wasn't working. A bit later, it did work for a while. Um, so what was what was really missing was um, an understanding of uh, of that experience. I really wanted to, um, you know, to be able to talk to someone who. Uh, who was f what we called fully realized and the Shankaracharya had died but there was a successor a successor to him and um I really wanted to to go and see him but he wouldn't allow anyone to so um there was a group of us within the society who were trying to um to get that to happen and we almost managed it but didn't didn't quite mm -hmm. um and then at that point, once uh, uh, someone else, in other words, came who didn't want that uh, connection to be re-established, came into power. And at that point, I thought, no, I've, I've got to look somewhere else. And that's where I spent about six months looking at all sorts of other different paths. Um, and then eventually um, settled on Rupert, who I had already... I, I'd never really known him when, when he was at the study society, although we we had we had certainly done Davish turning together because he's in very different groups to to me. Um, but um, he had come uh, to uh, the study society to give a talk, um, and so I had asked him a question then, um, and I decided to at that point to go back to to him and uh, pursue that direction. 
So what was it um, in Rupert's teaching? Because you say in, in your bio that it was through Rupert's teaching that you discovered the permanent and imperturbable peace, happiness and ease of being that is the birthright of us all. So what particularly in Rupert's articulation was it that uh, led you to that? So maybe it was a series of some things, but give us a flavour of what that was. It was really many one thing, and that's the, the understanding that um, real happiness is not a state of, of the mind, that what we're looking for is not in the mind. And I had conceptualised what I uh, had experienced as being a state of the mind, and I was trying to get back to that state. And it was the understanding that that was never, ever going to work. It, could, it couldn't work. Um, and it was it was understanding that, that that deep happiness, which I had already experienced and already knew, was there all the time. It was there even um, uh, there was a occasional returns of nothing like the deep, the dark night of the soul I'd experienced before, but um, sort of something part way towards that. Uh, which occurred and I, I thought oh no I've lost it again but then um, he, he brought me back no it's you, you haven't lost anything it's it, it's always there yes yeah I think um, when you've had a really profound glimpse like that and everything changes I, I, I had one and it lasted for two weeks um there's a tendency to, to almost hold that in your memory as the peak experience that you have to get back to. Yes. Um, and I think people can stay stuck in that search to, to, you know, what is it? How can I get back? How can I get it back? We can cycle around for years. So talk a little bit about how... Um, it's not a recapturing because it was never it was never experienced in the mind and and how we go forward because I'm sure there will be several people listening to us maybe many people listening to us who can say yeah I had one of those experiences and I lost it and there, there can be you know there can be a, a feeling of self blame you know I was, I was graced with this and then the ego came back in and I blew it you know that sort of of thinking can come in. So what, what would you say to people like that? Yes, I, I mean, I, I felt just that too. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess it's, I guess it's, uh, it, it, it's very common. Um, and it was, it, it was really the first actual meeting. I, I, I listened to a lot of um, Rupert's videos before I actually went to a meeting. I went to a meeting in Oxford. It was uh, it was something that happened there that that really um, changed things uh, for for me. And uh, so I was uh, I was asking him how how do I how do I get back um, mm -hmm. to to what I want to to what to what I know what I know I am um, and. He said, "It's it, it's really it, it's very really very simple. Um, you, you you just ask uh, the question um, that like we asked in in the meditation. And the meditation was based on the question, um, what uh, what does my awareness occur in? What what is it in? And he said, you just ask you just ask that." And then I, I didn't feel entirely happy with that. I said, I, I can't see how that's going to take me there. Yes, I was very happy during the meditation, but it was not quite the same. And then um, he, he said, okay, it's just like um, if you go into uh, an artist going into the forest and um, wanting to paint, um, well, what she sees and there's just light coming through the trees and you just paint the light you you're, you're, you're just 
Uh, you're just taken by the light. The trees don't matter. It's just the light. And I took that away with me. And somehow that, that sort of did the trick. It didn't do the trick completely. Um, but then uh, about a year later, I went on one of his so Let me just ask before you move on, what did you yes. do with that? You said it did the trick. But what, what did you, what did, how did you use that image of an artist going into the forest and focusing on the light? How, how did it do the trick? Um, well, because I, I do live near woodlands and I, it's, um, it's an experience that, uh, that I have very, very often, walking through beautiful woodland and seeing that light. And so I was just sitting down and just uh, just saying, yeah, I'm, what, 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 what is this awareness really? It is just this light, it is just the same as this light in the forest. And it was kind of re, um, using that physical experience of light in the forest um, in a way to to link me back to the light uh, of awareness that I am that light. Beautiful. Um, and then a bit later, but then a bit later on, I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't a permanent but it, it showed me the way back I could always find the way back but then when um, I went to the first retreat of his that I went to it was about a year after that um, and uh, that was when um, I, I'd been driving um, to, to get there and every everything everything was beautiful on on, on the way there but I had this, uh, again, this uh, this sudden feeling of terror that uh, arose in, in me, and I'd been unable to sleep. And so the following day, I asked him about that, and that was when he showed me that that um, that that light, that uh, that happiness, was underneath that uh, that terror. And we, we had a long dialogue with that. But, you know, it's not all in the words. It's the, there's something that's in the understanding that, that you share in that moment. And it, it's just for that. It's just for that moment. But it somehow it creates a change. Yeah, I think it's 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 just in that moment and it's just for you. <laughs> yes. Yes, because often you know I think we can listen to to YouTube videos, for example, or dialogues between you know teachers such as Rupert and other people, and then think, oh, I'll apply that, and then I'll get the same result. But th there de there certainly is some grace. I, th I always I love to use the word grace. That that what occurs in that moment in the interaction is for you at that moment is just perfect grace. Yes. 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 So after that, um, you wanted to deepen your understanding and then integrate it. So I can see the kind of full circle moment, you integrating all of your spiritual understanding back with your love of science and maths, which led you to Francis. Yes. So tell us about that. Tell us, tell us um, from your perspective, what's, what is the difference? Is there a difference? Because obviously we know, well, some people may not know, but um, Francis um, was Rupert's teacher. Yes. So almost yes. you've gone to the teacher's teacher now. Yes. Um, yes. So what, what prompted, um, a pa maybe it is just the, you know, to integrate the, the sort of science and maths, the different perspective. But tell us, tell us what that was, what, what that draw towards Francis was and what you have um, received from him. Yes, I didn't go directly to, uh, to Francis, really. What, what happened was um, I was going back and um, reading Jean Klein uh, again. And there was this 
this one uh, sentence from Jean Klein, which had always it was always mysterious, and but I just felt it was deep intuition. It was really important for me, uh, and that was um, live in not knowing, free from memory, and I. I wanted to know what that meant. I had the, the very last question I asked Rupert was, was exactly that. But I I felt that he didn't get to the core of my intuition about it. And I, I couldn't really formulate my my intuition. There was uh, the, the, there was something there was something missing there, and so it, it was for I suppose about three months or so. I, I felt I'd. Uh, I'd explored everything I could explore with, with Rupert and COVID had started at that point. So there were no more retreats. I went to his last in-person retreat before, before COVID. Um, so I was, I was on my own. It was lockdown, of course. Um, I, I was uh, on my own and just, just trying to, to work out what, what do I really know for certain? I, you know, I, I'd understand. I'd understood that the whole of science is is just models. Um, that, that, that science doesn't tell you the can't tell isn't you the reality of anything. Isn't that so interesting? Because in popular science, you know, the the, the man in the streets understanding of science, believe that science is exactly telling us how things are. So. It, it, it's, it, that's that's true. Yes. yes, I think it was my study of maths actually helped um, with, with that. And um, after I'd studied maths, I I also did a postgraduate qualification in statistics and worked as a statistician for a a, a while. And there you uh, you see that all of those models are statistical in, in nature. Um, so you you know that they're just models. They're just, the <laughs> there's there's room. There's there's freedom. There's room. Um, there, there's room for deviation uh, from from the model. And whereas earlier um, I wanted certainty, then I once after I had studied statistics and after that, uh, I suppose it had kind of settled in my understanding, I realized how beautiful it was, um, that, that we can't be certain about reality, about how things That's are. quite a journey, Jenny, isn't it? From being a small girl who wanted to know, in your own words, the very biggest things to the very little things. You wanted to know everything. Yes. <laughs> and you've ended up living and not knowing. <laughs> <laughs> I I know, <laughs> but then it was it was really two things that um, led me to Francis. Um, I'm a, a lovely friend of mine who I will be talking to next in, in my first podcast, uh, Rachna Chala. Um, she was um, uh, attending Francis's online sessions. He was running one every um, every day, in, in fact either a meditation or a satsang. And she would, um, just occasionally she'd send me her, her notes uh, of those. And I, I, I just loved it. And uh, I thought, gosh, this is, this is different from what I've heard before. Um, I didn't do anything at that point. Yeah, so, so it was at Bill Free's uh, Pure Presence Conference, I think the first one he ran, that I, uh, Francis was um, doing a question and answer session and I decided to ask him a question about not knowing and of course John Klein uh, was his teacher mm. so he was a, a very good person to to ask and that was just the start of a, a number of dialogues I, I had with, with him. what Francis's answer was? What, what was yes uh, absolutely so so the that um that first time I asked about it, he gave me the highest level of what knowing, not what not knowing means, and he he said, it it doesn't mean that you don't know how to drive or work a computer or anything like that. What it means is, you don't know 
what you are. You know that you are, you don't know what you are. And that that became so obvious uh, to me and I, I could see the trap um, that that maybe I had been falling in sometimes, not, not always, but uh, occasionally, um, which was, you know, we, we learn, I, I'm not this body, I'm not this, this mind. We, we, we discover that it, it becomes obvious. I'm, uh, I'm not a, a human being. I'm, uh, I'm not a woman. Um, and, uh, and so on. All of those are qualifications of I am. And what's important is the, it's the pure I am. But if you say I am pure consciousness, that in itself is also a limitation because it's, uh, it, it's conceptualizing consciousness as an object. And as soon as you have an object, you also have a subject. So there's I and uh, consciousness I, it's a, a, a qualification of I am and I realized so I realized how important that was it's it's obvious and you go back to what I am what I really am you you sink into into the silence of myself it's it it's obvious there's no there's no subject and there's no object but when we talk about it including when we talk about it to ourselves um it it can become dualistic. Yeah. Was it Nisargadatta that said every word, it was either Nisargadatta or Ramana Maharshi, I can't remember which, every word I ever speak is a lie. Yes. It, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so that was that was really that was really important for me. And I uh, I went on to um discuss with him idealism and realism because I I had assumed it was a huge shock to me when I listened to one of his um, YouTube videos um, where he explained that um, non-duality doesn't imply idealism it it doesn't imply uh, a universal mind that everything is universal mind but just um, just briefly explain idealism for those that may not be um familiar with that term okay i i there are many different forms of idealism but basically uh, it says that um everything is mind now if um if it's the form of idealism called solipsism, then everything is my mind right. there's nothing outside of my mind um but um uh, a more reasonable um, uh, form of idealism, um, which Bishop Barclay um, proposes. Um, there's just God's infinite mind. Everything is mind, but, but um, there's God's infinite mind. Or there's universal mind is the more of the, um, the direct pathway of, uh, of saying it. Mm -hmm. So I had thought um, that everything um, everything was mind. In, in other words, um, that we have night dreams, but then there's waking dreams which we share, and we share because we share parts of universal mind. That was what I that was what I thought, mm -hmm. and I I had thought um, I had gone through all sorts of reasoning, um, and. Uh, we, which which seemed to be absolutely clear to me. Um, but in fact, as Francis pointed out when I discussed it with him, was actually fallacious. Um, so um, that was wonderful. I always love it when something that, because I've always been anti-belief of any kind, right from a small child, I was anti-belief. Um, so whenever I find that Here's the one truth. of my beliefs is, <laughs> it is shown to be a belief, then that's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. so, so you said that you were shocked when Francis said that there could be something beyond or other than universal. Other. It's, that that's uh -huh. just a, 
Yes, that, that's just one. That's just one model. There's also realist models, which um, which say, yes, there's a that there may be a universe out there. It won't be um, exactly as we we see it. Not a universe made of matter, because science has shown us that's not the case. I mean, if you go to the ultimate in science, then you're you're into quantum fields where there's um, it's just fluctuations, um, prob fields of probability, fluctuations, particles coming into a, and out of uh, existence. But are they really particles? They have no solidity. It's more like packets of energy. So you, but still, there can be something outside that's different from mind that is not mind-like, in other words. So you would then have two realms and a mental realm, a physical realm, but both being made out of uh, consciousness, or, or the one reality, both sharing the one reality. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's an equally an equally equally good model. And that model was actually rather more attractive um, to me. Um, but then he said to me, well don't don't go with either model. Uh, be agnostic uh, about it. Live, live, in, not knowing. live in not knowing. And because isn't that actually the truth? Because we don't know and we can't know from this from this perspective. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Because that you know anything, um, any way of conceptualizing anything. Um, comes from a human mind and human minds are, are are limited and we have it well it, it's it's arrogant really um, to, to to say that r reality is how any human mind can conceptualize it yeah. yes it, it's crazy it's insanity really yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, there was another question that occurred to me there that has just slipped my mind um, oh yes I know what it was so it might be possible to think to be kind of pessimistic about living and not knowing you know, people might think well what's the point of this whole spiritual thing if I can never know I thought I was going to be able to know and yet you've you've said that um, that's where real freedom lies. So so talk a bit about that. Yes. How does that play out in in day to day life? Just this not knowing. Yes, it, it, it's it, it's in how you how you apply it. So people do want want certainty in their lives, certainty about what's going to happen in their. Uh, surrounding and, and in their circumstances and they worry um, if there's uncertainty so people worry about whether they're going to lose their jobs mm. um, or worry if um, they're not going to have enough money or th things like that it's all to do with uh, uncertainty and living in not knowing doesn't mean that you don't care about any of those things and you don't provide for any of those things uh, of course you, you you do if you need to work then uh, you use your intelligence and you look for a job but you recognize that you you might not find one and but because there's this deep happiness inside of yourself it it will be okay things things will be okay and somehow, if you have, if you have that attitude, think things will be okay. However, they, however they turn out, whatever's, whatever's going to happen, just allow it to happen. It's it, it's fine. But you you still take sensible precautions. I mean, uh, for example, there's a lot of COVID about. We might get COVID, but. You can wear a mask if you're in um, an indoor space with a lot of people around. You take a sensible precaution. You wear a mask. Now, 
you don't know, you can't be certain that because of that, you will not get COVID, you might. Um, but you've taken every sensible precaution you can. Maybe you opened a window and things as well. Um, so you've done everything you can. And the, 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 rest, the, the rest is just down to the universe. It's whatever's going to happen. And if you, if you feel I am, I am just this body and just this mind, and this body and this mind might be threatened by something, um, then, then you will feel worry. But it's when, when you recognize I'm, I'm not this, this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not just this body, I am the whole universe. I am everything. I am whatever has happened, whatever is happening, whatever is going to happen, I am all of that. Then somehow there's a, there's a peace and there's a freedom. But if there's resistance, which is, um, which is really what worry is, ultimately it's resistance. Um, then that that freedom goes. Yeah. So, but the strange thing is, if you live that way, you just have to try it. If you if you live that way, always remembering that you are not a limited being. You are not dependent um, on this body and this mind, um, and you. You always use your intelligence in a universal way, not not for personal uh, gain, but in a universal way. So yes, if you need a job, you look for a job. If you need money, you find ways of making money, um, but not not in opposition um, to to the universe. Somehow, things always do work out, and it's it's extraordinary how they do. Yeah, I was just just before we we started recording, I was um, contemplating something that said something along the lines of you always have everything you need. And yeah. I've always had a bit of a, an objection to that because I thought, you know, these things tend to be written by people who live in houses with, you know, access to a computer and um, probably a level of material comfort that gives them the luxury to explore these matters, perhaps. And today in my, and I was thinking, oh, there's, there's a fundamental bias there. You know, that's, that's not, I was just kind of mulling it over and, and, and it, it, just, it just occurred to me that, that we're given everything we need but what we don't need always is this human life. Yes. <laughs> and that, that just, it just struck me as, as, I just thought, oh my goodness, that just showed my attachment to, to, to this life, you know, to, 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 to being in, in this world, in this realm, um, for me and for other people, which belies the truth of who we are, which is eternal. Yes, it, it, exactly. It's yeah, it um, just—it really struck me, Jenny. You know, it, it, I just yeah. thought I've always kind of dismissed that. I thought, oh, I don't quite get that, but that doesn't quite fit, so I'm not going to look at it. But somehow this morning, it just—it just dawned on me. I thought, ah. It just shows a little attachment of mine to this human form in a particular state. I, I think that's just so, so important. Mm. It's, um, it's, it's been described as one of the, the, the roots of the sense of separation is the fear of death. Mm. And it's, uh, uh, as you did, it's really, a, it's really addressing that. And it's it's knowing well, you know this this body is is destined to to die anyway. It will, um, but so what? Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's a, it's okay. It's natural. Yeah, 
Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a that's another place where we naturally naturally live in not knowing without even knowing it. <laughs> because we yes. do not know the moment of our death. Exactly. You know, we assume, you know, I'm, I was 60 last week. So I think, you know, I'm healthy, 60, I'll get to 95, surely. You know, <laughs> we have no idea. No idea. Yeah, we have no idea at all. Yeah. No. So that brings us very nicely to um, the topic of your podcasts, which are all going to be around this living and not knowing. So um, just say again, the guest that you're having next month. So the the next one will be uh, my friend Rachna Chawla. And she's a she's a doctor. She's uh, um, works as a GP, but she also works um on um, uh, with with people from u- universities I- improving the methods that uh, GPs use, but at the same time she's also a, a, a poet and uh, she she writes she's published uh, two books of poems now, um, and I'm hoping she will read one of them, which is a little bit about not knowing. <laughs> Uh, when we do the podcast but yeah. it, it, so it will be about how um, how she applies that uh, in her life and not knowing it implies an openness it it uh, it, it, Im- it, it implies we're we're open to whatever happens and Ratchner is, a, is the most beautiful example of uh, of that openness great I'm really looking forward to that interview and to all the other uh, podcast episodes that you do for us, Jenny. I always love to talk to you and to hear you speak and teach. So um, thank you so much for joining our little crew of hosts on the Awareness Podcast. And I look forward to listening uh, to your episode in August. So thank you. I, so I like, look forward very much to um, to doing all the the podcasts, and uh, I think it will be great. And yes, thank you and Phil for inviting me. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>